What a beautiful prelude. His eye is on the sparrow. Good morning. Welcome to one and all. It's always good to see each and every one of you here. Uh, you could be anywhere you wanted to be this morning, but you chose to be here, so thank you. It's just a beautiful morning out there, isn't it? Uh, our flowers this morning are from Karen and Kenny Hitchcock. They're looking ahead to Mother's Day in honor of both of their mothers, uh, Dorothy and Helen. May they rest in peace, and may all the mothers have a beautiful week uh, leading up to their special day. Our bell choir will practice tomorrow at 6.30, and our Bible study is on Thursday at 10 a.m. Everyone's invited. And then we'll have two chances for the Pentecost offering. It's coming up on May 21st and also the 28th. And there's an insert in your bulletin. We'll have another opportunity to donate to Birdies for Charity as they do matching. So as we move closer to the John Deere Classic Tournament, you can fill that out. I think the deadline is June 16th. And if you have any questions about that, you can speak with Lynn Sheese about that. She continues to help us get that set up and manages that. Are there any other announcements? No hands? Okay, let's stand together and join in singing our opening hymn, Healer of Our Every Ill. It's number 506. to worship from your bulletin in you O Lord I seek refuge do not let me ever be put to shame in your righteousness deliver me you are indeed my rock and my fortress for your name's sake lead me and guide me you are my refuge. 
Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. Let us pray. Living God, Lord of creation, source of faith, thank you for hearing our prayers, for bringing us to yourself, and for making us your children. Thank you for making your love known to us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for his humility, his sacrifice, and his triumph. Thank you for your continuing presence with us in your Holy Spirit, holding us together as members of your family and giving us the courage to tell others about your love. Receive our gratitude and our praise this morning. May we honor you with our lives, here and everywhere, now and forever. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Let your heart be troubled. So thank you. That's, that's a really a good message, and it's a lead-in to our sermon topic. So we've been spending uh, many of our Sundays in the Gospel of John, kind of listening in right, and learning right along with the apostles as they traveled around with Jesus in Galilee and Jerusalem. So we're kind of overhearing Jesus' teaching and observing the apostles as they try to absorb the great truths that Jesus offered to them. So the scene for our reading this morning is that Jesus and his closest disciples have just finished the Last Supper. And Jesus gives kind of a long farewell speech. And he means that speech to be a comfort and an encouragement and an assurance to the apostles. But they don't find it that way. They find Jesus' message disturbing. And rather than being comforted, they find themselves unsettled. Because they don't like the sound of Jesus' talk. They don't want to hear about his upcoming death. And they don't like the sound of carrying on his work without him right there by their sides. And actually they had a hard time even understanding what Jesus was talking about, so they had questions. And since this is graduation season, it might help for us to think of John chapters 13 through 17 as a graduation speech. If you look in a red letter Bible, this section has way more red print than black print. So it's like uh, Jesus knew what the apostles were wondering and uh, he knew what they wanted him to spell out for them. They were asking, why didn't he just sum it up, make the big picture easier for them to understand? If he was leaving, they felt like they needed a refresher course or some kind of a parting words of wisdom. They wanted or needed a going away present that gave them clarity, gave them a dose of much needed hope. As we listen in, we have questions of our own. What does it mean that we are the church? What are our marching orders? What does it mean to say that the job description of the church includes things like persistent faithfulness, loving one another, abiding in Christ? So we keep learning and growing as we go along. So we have a lifelong mission and we're encouraged to practice discipleship, to be followers of Christ, to be imitators of Christ. So all those descriptions help, but they all need unpacking as we go through our lives. But thankfully, we're not alone. We have divine help. As Jesus said, the Father who abides in me does his works. So paying attention to what Jesus has said and done means that we're hearing and seeing what God has done, is doing. We are participants in the work of God that's already in progress. So as we discussed last week, we have abundant life here on earth and we're promised abundant life with God for eternity. So Jesus has just washed the feet of the disciples, presided over the Last Supper, and Judas has just left the building. That's the context of the after dinner speech Jesus delivered to the worried apostles. So let's listen in John chapter 14 verses 1 through 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, Show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own. 
but the Father who dwells, dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So Jesus knew his apostles very well after traveling around with them and teaching them for three years. And he knew that they were heavy hearted on this occasion. So his words on that final evening together were meant to be uplifting for them. He told them that they were in him just as he, Jesus, was in the Father. He gave them a prescription for their worries and for the fears and the concerns that were weighing them down. He told them not to let their hearts be troubled. He reminded them that faith is the best prescription for a troubled heart. Believe me, he told them. Don't, do not believe in me, but believe me when I tell you how things stand. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You have some say-so here, he seemed to be telling them. If you're already there, if you're already worrying, then knock it off. Don't go there, don't land there, or at least don't stay there. Don't dwell there in a troubled state of mind. Don't let your heart be uneasy. Even when the world around you feels super troubled and stuck in a state of unrest and dis-ease, don't let your heart be troubled. And the apostles were struggling to picture how in the world they were ever going to be able to carry on without Jesus beside them and leading them. And Jesus gave them some pretty specific assurances. And it's not so different for us. We have similar concerns. We are also encouraged to abide in Jesus and to trust in his promises. But how can we do that on a consistent basis? How can we keep those truths in mind when things are closing in or blowing up? So we can only be successful in our spiritual lives. We can only stay on the right path by following this instruction from Jesus. I am the way, the straight and narrow path that leads to truth. And I am the road that leads to true life, to everlasting life in the house of God. Now, way back in the Middle Ages, uh, Thomas Akempis put it this way, without the way, there is no going. Without the truth, there is no knowing. Without life, there is no living. I am the way which you must follow, the truth in which you must believe, the life for which you must hope. So it's no wonder the apostles were confused by the promise that they would do greater works than Jesus did. They must have been thinking, wait, what? What did Jesus mean by that? Are we supposed to walk on water, heal the sick, raise the dead? What greater works was he referring to? Well, one school of thought suggests that the primary emphasis when it came to carrying on the work of Jesus was the proclamation of the good news. That may well be the works that the apostles were called to carry forward. And as you can tell from many of our gospel readings, the disciples weren't a very promising group at times. They're often presented as being in the dark about what Jesus was telling them and what he was up to, even as they traveled around side by side with him for so long. So they weren't a promising group until they received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And then, look out. They changed the world in just a few short decades. Their work resulted in the conversion of a greater total number of people than Jesus preached to during his earthly ministry. So they performed great uh, performed greater works in terms of the good news of the gospel flowing out into Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Ask in my name. In answer to their questions, Jesus told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So there's another one of those I am statements 
that John has scattered all around in his gospel. Jesus was emphasizing his relationship with the Father. And John wrote here in the context of that ongoing relationship about the nature of faith. He wrote about the destination that awaits us. The King James Version referred to those dwelling places in the house of God as mansions. But our more recent translation simply say dwelling places. There's a context too uh, where those places or those stations are kind of like those cooling and hydration stations they have when the runners run the Bix. There's places of refreshment all along the journey. And I like that image of finding rest and being sustained as we move through life. And it helps to know that we're being strengthened in our belief just as the apostles were strengthened in theirs when hard times appeared. There are no less than six instructions to believe in these 14 verses. Our belief and our hope is not in others as we can see from the life of Judas. Our belief and our hope is not in ourselves as we can see from Peter's claim at the end of chapter 13 that he was ready to die with Christ as that claim turned out to be dampened by three denials in just another day or two after that. Our belief and our hope is in Jesus who showed us through his belief and his way of life what God is like. Our belief and hope is in Jesus' promise that God's house has many dwelling places, including one for you and one for me. There's room for us. The preparations have already been made. Now, it might help us to think of the path of faith, including God's provision and refreshment, sustenance and encouragement, all along the way and not just in the hereafter. Like Thomas and Philip, it's okay for us to ask for a boost in faith. It's okay for us to ask for a greater understanding and a greater sense of walking on the way with Jesus. We can ask for help with trusting in the person and work of the Son of God. We can ask God to help us with our belief. Now we'll continue this section of John's Gospel next week and we'll talk more about the promise of the Holy Spirit. And then in two weeks we'll talk about the high priestly prayer of Jesus in John chapter 17. That was his prayer of intercession to the Father right before he was handed over to be put on trial and to be sentenced to death on the cross. So our adventure in John's Gospel gives us much to think about. Jesus' work of living out and spreading the good news became the mission of the disciples and their purpose in life. And we see this group of 11 close followers of Christ referred to as disciples and then later on as apostles. So these guys with troubled hearts would receive the power of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and fulfill the mission that Jesus gave them here after the Last Supper. So they were being sent out. Jesus' final instructions to the group went something like this. You'll be going out on your own. Know that I'm going to be with you, but not in the same way that you've been used to. Our relationship will change. Stand firm, hold fast. Abide in me even when or especially when you feel troubled. Ask for help. Jesus told the unsettled group, fear not. Do not be afraid. Don't let yourselves be anxious. Don't let your heart be troubled. You'll be taking over now. Any questions? And I can just imagine Thomas, you know, the impulsive one. He's got his hand up right away, waving it around. Yeah, he had a question. Going away? What do you mean, going away? To where? We don't have a clue what you're talking about. We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And then Philip, just show us the Father and it will be enough for us. Jesus told them that his destination was going to be theirs too. Thomas and Philip were asking for a road map. Jesus told them that he was the road map. As followers of Jesus, we're walking the path that he walked. We're on a journey that sometimes feels like we're passing through the wilderness, just like the children of Israel did after they escaped from bondage in Egypt. 
The way of discipleship is not always the smoothest road we could choose. The way of truth is not always freshly paved and free of potholes. So we need the same encouragement that the apostles received here from Jesus. We need the same advice, the same assurance, and the same promises. And it's easy for us to have troubled hearts and to feel ill at ease about problems and about the fleeting nature of life. Believe in God, said Jesus. Believe also in me. Believe in Jesus by following him. Receive the same assurances that he gave his closest followers in this graduation speech. He knew they were heavy hearted. His words were meant to be an encouragement to them and to us. Philip said, show us the Father and it will be enough for us. And Jesus replied, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Now that's a pretty specific reply with a clear implication that we should have the belief we need to be followers who can change the world. Now we might push back and say, easier said than done. And while it isn't always easy to abide in Christ, we do have the tools that we need. We have the resources for walking the path of faith. We have the Lord who hears us when we pray. We have the Word of God in Scripture to comfort and guide us through those hard times. And we have each other to lean on. Troubled hearts make sense if we look at our own failures or the failures of those we have trusted. And it's easy to grow disappointed. It's easy to feel ill at ease in this world. And our hearts will only be untroubled when we look to the end of the story, to the victory that has already been won for us in the resurrection and in the promised place that we have waiting for us in the house of God. So the end of the story is a happy one. Jesus has gone ahead of us and he has prepared a place for us. We have what we need to carry on the work that we've been given. We have a rich heritage and a bright future as we follow the Savior who is the way and the truth and the life here in this life and forevermore. Amen. Our prayer hymn today is number 82, His Eye is on the Sparrow.
Lord be with you. Lift your hearts up to the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come to you with grateful hearts and we thank you that you see us and you know us even before we pray. We hold fast to the assurance that you hear us when we pray and we give you praise for your love, for our families, and for the abundant life that you have promised us. We humbly ask that you renew our hope as we're gathered in your house today. We are dependent upon your mercy and grace as we go about our daily lives. We ask you for those occasional glimpses of your glory which provide us with the strength to go on in faith. Be our hope, O Lord, as we live our lives and as we do the best that we can day by day. We pray for our fast-paced world and for all who rush through life in an attempt to keep ahead of the rapidly passing time. We pray for all who are then passed by and forgotten in the haste of our particular way of living. We pray for healing for those who are sick. We pray for all of those here who aren't feeling well today in body, mind, or spirit. And we pray for each of the names on our prayer list. Remind us as we go through the week to lift up those family members, those neighbors, and those friends in daily prayer. And we ask for continued recovery from surgery. We pray for upcoming tests and procedures. We pray for comfort for any who may be worn out and discouraged by all that they face. Open our eyes and our hearts to recognize and support all those among us who may be hurting, those who may need our prayers for whatever reason and maybe our presence. Strengthen us to be your presence, your peace, and your loving arms as we reach out to others with your love. And may your Holy Spirit work in and through our lives bringing us closer to you and to your kingdom. Lord, we're gathered here today in part to remind each other that nothing can separate us from your love. We need that message of hope as we navigate our complicated lives. And we praise you today and we ask that you will bless each person here and give them a renewed sense that you are the way and the truth and the life. We're grateful that you hear us and love us with an everlasting love. Grant us your peace and strengthen us to be an encouragement to others. Help us be your followers, bearing good news out to the world. And we pray in Jesus' name, the one who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen as believers Jesus gave us the same work to do that he, he pursued upon the earth, feeding the poor, healing the sick, and preaching about God's kingdom. He promises up that he will provide every resource and assistance we need as we offer our financial resources today. So let us offer a prayer that Jesus will abundantly multiply these gifts for the fruitful work of God's kingdom. The uh, deacons will now take your offerings.
God of gracious living, may those blessed by these gifts, these are gifts to come to know you as God's fullness and abundance. Through the habits of our giving, may we reveal your eternal truth and glory. Amen. Please be seated. Come, people of faith, come to this table, the Lord's table, to remember and to know. It is here that we commune together, and that's the way revealed in the completeness. The truth is embraced and hold us. That life is claimed forever. We, at 15th Avenue here, invite all believers to partake. Uh, please join us in the communion hymn here at thy table, Lord, 384. <clears throat> Receive from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took a piece of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance for me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, Proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to assemble here and to remember the meal that Jesus celebrated with his disciples. We gather around this table to recommit our lives to following Jesus' example in breaking bread and sharing the cup. May we prepare our hearts to receive these, your gifts to us. Show us the way, Father God, as we remember Christ's living presence and the instructions he gave the apostles on the evening of the Last Supper. Bless these emblems and receive our praise and our gratitude. We pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
If any here wish to join the church, we ask that you come forward on the final verse of our closing hymn. And our practice is to welcome new members through a simple profession of faith. And our invitation hymn is number 272. Let's stand and sing the church's one foundation. Jesus has gone on to a place where we can't follow for now. But a place has been prepared for each one of us and we won't run into any of those Ticketmaster problems in that venue. So there are many rooms in the house of God, O oh, happy ones and holy. Lord, give us grace that we, like them, the meek and lowly, on high may dwell with thee. So now, hear now our benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. So go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>